This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 8 for August 15 to 21, ready for teaching on August 22, Ministering Like Jesus, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and what it brings to us, a description of who you are, but also shares with us the love that you have, the compassion and the care that you have for each one of us. And as this week we look at the life of Jesus and how he intermingled and related with people, may we understand more fully the relationship that he had with people, but also how his method of sharing will be of benefit to us and the people we meet, that they may know you more fully. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Let's read that again, Matthew 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus genuinely cared for people. He was more interested in their concerns and needs than in his own. His life was totally centred on other people. His was a ministry of loving compassion. He met the physical, mental and emotional needs of the people around him, and thus their hearts were open to the spiritual truths he taught. As he healed lepers, opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, delivered demoniacs, fed the hungry and cared for the needy, hearts were touched and lives changed. That's because as people saw his genuine concern, they were open to the spiritual truths that he taught. Ellen White wrote in Ministry of Healing, page 143, this beautiful passage. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. End of quote. Jesus recognised that the world needed a demonstration of the gospel as much as it needed its proclamation. The living witness of a Christ-like life, committed to ministering to others, is a powerful testimony to the words we speak and gives credibility to our witness. Sunday, August 16. Jesus' Attitude Toward People Jesus always looked for the good in others. He drew out the best in them. One of the criticisms the religious leaders of his day had with Jesus was that he receives sinners and eats with them. Luke 15 verse 2. They were concerned because he fellowshiped with the ungodly. Their view of religion was one of estrangement rather than engagement. They were surprised when Jesus said of himself, For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance in Matthew 9.13. The scribes, Pharisees and Sadducees' religion was one of avoidance. They thought, Do everything you can to avoid becoming contaminated with sin. Though uncontaminated by sin, Jesus plunged into this snake pit of a world to redeem it, not to avoid it. He is the light of the world, as we read in John 8, verse 12. Question, read Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14. What two illustrations did Jesus use to describe his followers? Why do you think he used those specific illustrations? See also John 1.9, John 12.46 and Philippians 2 verse 
15. Let's start with Matthew 5 and verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And these other texts, John 1 verse 9, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And John 12 verse 46, I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And Philippians 2 verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Salt was one of the most important resources in the ancient world. It was extremely valuable, and at times the Roman legions used it as currency. It was a symbol of great wealth. It also was used to preserve and flavour food. When Jesus used the illustration of salt to symbolise his followers, he was really saying that the true wealth of the world is not the world's most powerful and richest people. The true wealth of the world is committed Christians who are making a difference for the kingdom of God. Their loving acts of unselfish service preserve the world's goodness and flavour its atmosphere. The second illustration Jesus uses in Matthew 5.14 was that of the light of the world. Light does not avoid darkness. It shines in the darkness. It does not separate from the darkness. It penetrates the darkness, making the darkness light. Jesus' followers are to penetrate the darkness of this world in their neighbourhoods, villages, towns and cities to lighten them with the glory of God. And so to finish today, after considering Jesus' words in John 17 verses 15 to 18, actually why don't we read that before I read the rest of this sentence. John 17 beginning at verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. After considering Jesus' words in John seventeen fifteen to 18 how are we to understand the idea of separation from the world and avoidance of the world? Are they the same thing? What did Jesus mean when he prayed that his followers would be in the world, but not of the world? How do we do that? Monday, August 17. Jesus' Treatment of People Jesus' goal was to bring out the best in people. Even when the circumstances were unusually challenging, he responded with grace. Luke's Gospel records that the crowds marvelled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, Luke 4.22. And John's Gospel adds that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in John 1.17. His approach to people was disarming. His gracious words touched a responsive chord in their hearts. Question, read Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 to 10 and Mark 12 Verse 34. What hope-filled words did Jesus speak to two unlikely people, a Roman centurion and a Jewish scribe? First of all, Matthew 8, beginning at verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, 
but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marvelled and said to those who followed, Assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And Mark 12, verse 34. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Jesus' statement to a Roman military commander was revolutionary. Think of how this career army officer must have felt when Jesus claimed that he had not found this degree of faith even in Israel. Also, think about the Jewish scribes' thoughts when Jesus said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus had the ability to bring out the best in people. There are few things that go as far as a compliment to open hearts for the gospel. Look for the good in people around you, and let them know you appreciate them. Question. Compare Isaiah 42 verse 3 and Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6, and Ephesians 4 verse 15. What vital principles do these texts teach us about sharing our faith with others, and about our relationship with them? Isaiah 42 Verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. And Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And then Ephesians 4, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. When our words are encouraging and filled with grace, they have a positive influence on the lives of others. Isaiah's prophetic words reveal that Jesus would not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flax. In other words, Jesus was so compassionate that he was careful not to bruise unnecessarily someone who was just coming to faith, or to quench the slightest embers of faith in their hearts. So to finish today, why is how we say something as important as, or even more important than, what we say? How do you react to this statement? Truth is truth, and people need to take it or leave it. What's wrong with this statement? Tuesday, August 18, Jesus Healing Ministry, Part 1. Our Lord's method of evangelism goes beyond memorised speeches and canned presentations. It is as rich and dynamic as life itself. Every day we rub shoulders with people who have all kinds of needs, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. Christ is eager to meet those needs through us as we show concern for people's loneliness, sorrow and heartache and as we show an interest in their joys, hopes and dreams. Jesus ministered to people's felt needs so that he could ultimately meet their deepest needs. A felt need is an area of life in which people already sense that they cannot solve an issue by themselves. It may be a need to quit smoking, reduce weight, get on a better diet or reduce stress. It may be a need for food, housing or medical care. It may be the need for counselling for the marriage or family. An ultimate need, however, is what human beings need most. The need for a personal relationship with God and the realisation that their life has eternal significance. Reconciliation with God in a broken world is our ultimate need. Question, read the stories of the paralytic in Matthew 9, 1-7, and the woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5, verses 25-34. to 34. 
What indications do we have in both of these stories that Jesus linked physical healing with meeting the ultimate need for reconciliation with God? First of all, Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic man on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose, and departed to his house. And Mark 5, beginning at verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction." The healing ministry of Christ included much more than physical and emotional healing. Jesus longed for people to experience the wholeness that sin's brokenness had shattered. For Christ, physical healing without spiritual healing was incomplete. If God's love motivates us to desire an individual's physical and emotional well-being, it also will motivate us much more to desire that person's spiritual well-being, so that he or she can live life to the fullest here and through all eternity. After all, every person whom Jesus healed eventually died. Hence their real need above everything else was spiritual, was it not? And so to finish today... What kinds of initiatives can our church take in our community to meet people's needs and demonstrate that we really care for them? Think about the people in your community. What is your church doing to make a difference in people's lives? Wednesday, August 19, Jesus' Healing Ministry, Part 2. Question. Read Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 to 25, and Matthew 9, 35. What threefold approach formed the basis for Christ's ministry? How did he meet people's needs? And what impact did it have on their lives? First of all, Matthew 4, beginning at verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kind of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him, from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And Matthew 9, verse 35, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
Jesus combined the threefold ministry of teaching, preaching and healing. He shared eternal principles so that all of us could live lives of meaning and purpose. He said in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. His ministry revealed a superabundance of grace, and Jesus came to enable us to live lives of superabundance, now and forever. Question. Read Mark 1, verses 32 to 39. Jesus spent all day healing the sick and casting out demons. After spending time in prayer the next morning, when multitudes more were seeking even more healing, he left for another city. Why didn't he heal them? Notice his own reason in the last two verses. Mark 1, beginning at verse 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long time before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and casting out demons. This story is insightful. After healing multitudes the day before, the next day Jesus leaves the crowds who were seeking him and who were still in need of healing. His explanation is that the purpose for which he came into the world was to preach the gospel. Jesus was not merely some spectacular miracle worker. He was the divine Son of God who came on a redemptive mission. He was not content merely to heal physical diseases. He longed for people to receive the gift of eternal life that he had to offer. He clearly stated the purpose for his coming to earth in these words, in Luke 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Thus, each act of healing was an opportunity to reveal God's character, relieve suffering, and provide an opportunity for eternal life. So to finish today, is it possible to live the abundant life Jesus offers if you are poverty-stricken or sick? Did Jesus offer people something deeper than physical healing? In what practical ways can we lead people to spiritual truths when we minister to their physical and emotional needs? Thursday, August 20. What matters to Jesus? Jesus' message to his disciples in Matthew 24 that blends events regarding the destruction of Jerusalem and the days before his return is followed by three end-time parables in Matthew 25. These parables outline the character qualities that really matter to Jesus for a people waiting for his second coming. The parable of the ten virgins emphasizes the importance of a genuine, authentic, spirit-filled life. The parable of the ten talents underlines the importance of faithfully using the gifts that God has given to each one of us. The parable of the sheep and goats reveals that genuine Christianity truly ministers to the needs of those God brings into our lives each day. Question. Read Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. How does Jesus describe genuine Christianity? List the areas of ministry this passage speaks about. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. 
and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Although this parable speaks of meeting people's genuine physical needs, an aspect of the story we should not neglect, is it possible that there is something more here? There is a hidden hunger and thirst for Jesus in the souls of human beings that longs to be satisfied. We read this in John 6.35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And John 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. We are all strangers longing for home until we discover our true identity in Christ. As we read in Ephesians 2, 12 and 13, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are naked spiritually until clothed with his righteousness, as we read in Revelation 3.18 and Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8. So, Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold trifined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. And Revelation 19, beginning at verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The Old Testament prophets often described the human condition as one that was hopelessly sick. Isaiah 1 verse 5, Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. And Jeremiah 30, 12 to 15. For thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause, that you may be bound up. 
You have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased, why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable, because of the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. I have done these things to you. The disease of sin is fatal. But the prophet points us to the remedy in Jeremiah 30, verse 17. For I will restore health to you and heal your wounds, says the Lord. Jesus is the remedy for the life-threatening disease of our souls. The parable of the sheep and goats admonishes us to meet the physical needs of those around us. But it does much more. It is the story of a Christ who meets the deepest needs of the soul, and it is his invitation to partner with him in ministering to those around us. To live self-centred lives and neglect the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual needs of others is to risk eternal loss. In the parable, those who give their lives for something more than themselves are commended by their Lord and welcomed into eternity, while those who selfishly pursue their own agenda and neglect the needs of others are condemned by their Lord. Friday, August 21. From the book The Ministry of Healing, page 145, many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in man, but they appreciate acts of sympathy and helpfulness. As they see one with no inducement of earthly praise or compensation coming to their homes, ministering to the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, comforting the sad, and tenderly pointing all to him whose love and pity the human worker is but the messenger. As they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. They see that God cares for them, and they are prepared to listen as his word is opened. End of quote. The unselfish ministry of Jesus opens hearts, breaks down prejudice, and creates a receptivity for the gospel. The church is the body of Christ meeting needs in love everywhere. Christ sends us out into our communities to make a difference in his name. Though we certainly need to be careful about being contaminated by the world, and that is a very real and dangerous threat to our church, we still must learn to reach the people where they are and to be used by God, who wants to take them from where they are and bring them to where they should be. And that brings us to our five discussion questions for this week. One... Why is the compassionate ministry of Christ so powerful in breaking down the prejudice and opening people up to hear spiritual truths? Try to imagine how much more effective our witness as a people would be were we to reflect the same selfless concern for others as Jesus did. 2. Think about a time when you said something that might have been true, correct or even needed, but you said it wrong. That is, you said it with a bad tone or attitude. What did you learn from that experience that could help you not to do it again, such as waiting until you calm down before speaking? 3. Dwell more on the idea that all the people healed or even raised from the dead would eventually die. What should that tell us about how we ought to be conducting our outreach and ministry to those around us? 4. What types of ministries can your church launch in your community that you are not currently doing? And five, how can we create spiritual opportunities for seekers through our felt needs ministries? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Surprise Treat in Sudan, 
and it's by Glenn Mitchell. Living in Sudan was a challenge for a Seventh-day Adventist couple working for the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA. Daily temperatures hovered at 102 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit, or 39 to 42 degrees in Celsius, from May to September. A cold drink was a treat after a day of work for my wife, Suzanne, and me. Returning home one day, I followed Suzanne into the kitchen and hopped up onto the counter to chat while she prepared a meal. As I sat on the counter, swinging my feet as a boy does, Suzanne asked me what I wanted to drink. "'What do you have?' I asked. Placing her hands on her hips, she informed me in a hoarse voice, "'I have orange Fanta, root beer, or Sprite.' "'Hmm, I want squirt,' I said, referring to a favourite cold drink that I hadn't seen since leaving our home in the United States. "'I don't have any squirt,' Suzanne said, maintaining the same hoarse voice. I jumped off the kitchen counter and threw myself on the floor and, in a manner of a child, began to throw a tantrum. Kicking my feet and pounding my fist, I demanded the beverage. "'I want squirt! I want squirt!' I cried. It was to no avail. There was no squirt. Suzanne and I laughed and laughed about our silliness. Moments like these made hard days easier to bear. Two hours later, a friend pulled into our driveway. She worked with the U.S. Agency for International Development in Sudan's capital Khartoum and acted as our liaison officer for several ADRA projects funded by USAID. She allowed us to receive mail at her official address and on this day she was delivering a box with much-weighted hair products from the United States. I tore open the box, knowing our American friends would have included a bag of chocolate-covered raisins for her. Sure enough, the coveted bag of raisins lay right on top. Underneath the raisins were nestled two bottles of hair conditioner. But wait, something more seemed to be in the box. Digging under the packing paper, I found, waiting in its all its glory, a big bottle of squirt. I had never requested the beverage from anyone in the United States, but on a hot day in Sudan, God provided a special treat. Weeks before I had asked Suzanne for the drink, the bottle was on its way to Khartoum. God cares even about the smallest details of our lives, and he loves, as we read in Desire of Ages, page 623, to give is to live. God promises those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing in Psalm 34 verse 10. When God saw me being silly and throwing my tantrum, he must have smiled and thought, wait and see what I have in store for you. And there's a photograph of uh, Suzanne and Glenn right there, a beautiful couple who gave part of their life in service in another country for God and to serve the people who needed help. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.